Hello, and welcome to the 26th episode of the LI Law Podcast. I'm your host, Zahava Schechter. The premise of this podcast is to feature issues, developments, and topics affecting the law and how it relates to the 8 million of us who live and work on Long Island, New York, which includes Nassau, Suffolk, Queens, and Kings Counties. If you live or work on Long Island, this podcast on local and state legislative and judicial decisions is for you. Our guest on this 26th episode is Paul Bugoni, Senior Underwriting Counsel for WFG National Title Insurance Company. Paul is a New York City native and earned his Bachelor of Arts degree from CW Post College of Long Island University and his Juris Doctorate from Quinnipiac University School of Law. Prior to his position as in-house counsel with WFG, Paul acted as agency counsel at Stewart Title Insurance Company and was previously in private practice handling both real estate litigation and transactional work. Paul is a member of the New York State Bar Association, serves on the New York State Land Title Association Law and Forms Committee, and is a member of the Real Property Law Section Committee on Title Insurance. Please check out the show notes for a full list of Paul's credentials and contact information. Please keep in mind that we will not be providing legal advice to any specific questions. Paul, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Paul, could you please tell us what is title insurance and why do Long Island property owners need it? Well, title insurance is basically it's a form of insurance where it's it's some people like to call it a necessary evil. And if it's it's like fire insurance, uh, you, you hope you never need it. Title insurance is, is that type of insurance that you purchase when you buy a house. Of course, for the vast majority, the overwhelming majority of people purchasing a house Purchasing a home is the greatest single financial transaction they will ever make in their lifetimes. It is their investment. It's also applicable to condo, condominiums as well, right? And to commercial real estate. Absolutely. Industrial, commercial, um, regardless. There is title insurance on a, virtually every type of property. Generally, you don't always see it on co-ops, but there are ways of buying policy, even for co-ops. Eagle Nine policies, Eagle right? Nines, correct. Okay, and what is the role of a title insurance company, specifically as an underwriter? What we do is, you'll, you'll there are generally two ways of purchasing title insurance. You can go through an agent, or you can go through a direct operation. A direct operation, you're buying the title insurance directly from the underwriter. Can you explain to our listeners what an underwriter is? Okay, an underwriter is we're basically we are the company that, or the uh, we are the entity that bears the brunt of any losses. In other words, we are the financial strength behind the um, title insurance. So it's like buying an Apple phone directly from Apple as opposed to going through Verizon. Correct. Uh, that is uh, that is a direct operation. That is what we call the directs now. There are also ways of buying title insurance, and you could go through an agent. And generally, agents will have uh, multiple underwriters. So if you're a big agent um, selling title insurance, it's not unheard of to have six or seven underwriters. Is there a financial benefit for a property owner to go directly to an underwriter as opposed to an agent or vice versa? Absolutely not, because here in New York, we are a filed rate state. So regardless, it's not like shopping around where you can go online for at, at progressive and shop car insurance versus state farm and all state. Um, that is not the way title insurance works. Title insurance is a one-time premium when you buy the property or when you go out and you get a mortgage. It's a one-time premium, and it covers you. And um, What does you, it cover you for? What do losses. people get when they, when they buy title insurance? Well, the, the primary, um, like any type of insurance, regardless of any type of insurance, the first thing you get is always peace of mind. You want to make sure that the house or the property, whatever building that you bought, is free and clear of any liens or free and clear of any bad actors in the back chain. That means money owed to creditors of the prior owner in title. Correct. Right? Correct. That's just one example. There's also, we've had instances where we've had flat out fraud and forgery, forged deeds. And just so everybody knows, in New York, there is no statute of limitations on, on a forged deed. So if a deed was forged 50 years ago, that title that emanated forward from that 
is all bad. It's a bad title. Okay, so let's clarify for a moment. The, the deed is the document which transfers ownership of real property from a seller to a purchaser, correct? Correct. So really, it behooves a potential purchaser of property to buy title insurance because there's no way to know if in the past history of the property, if there was forgery or there was bad action. Absolutely. Compared to the peace of mind and to the value of properties, uh, the value of the properties, especially down here in Nassau, Suffolk, and in the five boroughs, and in Westchester, you know, downstate, or as we like to say, zone two in the zone two area. New York is divided into two zones for title insurance purposes. It's the best title, uh, title insurance is the best uh, peace of mind that you can have. So if I purchase a piece of property and then someone comes and says, no, I am the owner, meaning someone else is claiming title ownership of the property, what do I do as a property owner? What you would do is most likely the first thing you should be doing is notifying the attorney who represented you because chances are, in 99.9% .9 of the cases, the attorney is the one who made the arrangements to buy the title insurance. And at closing, when you acquired a piece of property, let us assume that it's a residential piece of property and you're doing your traditional arm's length closing. You take a mortgage out. Arm's length being you're buying, buying. from someone to whom you don't know, not Correct. someone related to you, not a friend. Absolutely. It's, you know, again, I'm going to use the most generic type of example. You want to buy a house in a certain area. You have kids like myself. I wanted to buy a house. I, I, I I outgrew my house where I was living. My family was growing, so I went up into Westchester, retained the services of a real estate broker. Real estate broker found me the house. Obviously, because of my knowledge, uh, you know, I was able to, I represented myself. But you will retain an attorney to represent you in the purchase, and the, and the attorney has relationships with various title companies, and they he will make the arrangements for the title insurance. And also... What's important is it's not just your attorney who reviews the title. The bank attorney also reviews the title. That's the bank if you are if you have a mortgage. Correct. If it's a cash deal, there is no bank attorney. Correct. Right? Okay, but I want to go back. Very good. Thank you mm -hmm. for that. I want to go back to our situation where someone claims to own my property. Okay. So you said I go back to the attorney who represented me in the underlying transaction, and then what happens? Well, that attorney will file a claim. Uh, there's an adverse, there's an interest uh, being claimed that is adverse to the quiet title that you, that you will typically get when you buy a piece of property. So you have an individual who's claiming that he owns it. Your attorney should turn around and file a claim with the underwriter. And then the title insurance company will represent me? Correct. To defend me, basically. Correct. As counsel to WFG, what is your role? What do you do, Paul? Well, um, I'm going to be honest. It's, it's, it's an interesting uh, position. Um, in, as being underwriting counsel because I am uh, with the agency department. So I talk to a number of agents and what they will do is they will call me up with various issues. Uh, it's not always as simple. Very, very rarely do you have a complete 100% pure, pristine title. There will always be some, maybe some liens in the back chain. There may uh, be a foreclosure involved in the house, maybe not at the immediate level, but maybe two or three transactions ago, there may have been a foreclosure. There may so, have been a so property So it's very dispute. important to review the title report clearly and thoroughly, right? Uh, to make absolutely. sure that there are no problems with transferring the ownership from the current seller. Correct. And generally, just so you know, the bottom line is, is recommended practices 40 years. So a title company should go back 40 years. What are some t common title issues which you see on Long Island? Okay. Um, I see... A lot of times, especially with regard to residential properties, I see a lot of um, mortgages that are never satisfied. That is a big problem. Let's explain what that means. What is a satisfaction of a mortgage? Satisfaction of a mortgage is a $5 word for basically it's a receipt when that you paid off your mortgage. So if you have a mortgage and you sell your house at the sale, um, the seller will take a portion of the money, or should I say the title company, the title closer, will take a portion of that money and send a check out to the bank. The bank cashes the check and should prepare what we call a satisfaction of mortgage. And the it, it's like a paid in full Correct. receipt. It's, it's, and the receipt gets recorded. 
gets recorded. Here's the problem, though, that I see. In Nassau County in particular, it costs over $700 to file the satisfaction. So what I'm hearing from colleagues of mine who also practice real estate law is that their clients don't want to incur that fee. So even if they get the satisfaction, they're just holding on to it. That is a problem because that's going to be a problem if when they go to sell, sell when they um, when their buyer goes to sell. Now there is the problem because that's when title insurance would kick in, and I'll tell you why. That what what's important about that. One thing I always suggest and I always ask is for people to keep their records. Now everybody says the deed, the deed, the deed. I always tell people that's probably the second most important document a buyer receives. A buyer should keep very, very tight lid, tight hold, uh, store his owner's policy. When you buy title insurance, you get an owner's policy. And that owner's policy is proof that you have title insurance. Mm -hmm. And that should be stored along the same lines as you would with a will or trust. And I want to go back to the satisfaction for a minute because Mm -hmm. as people do not, especially in Nassau County where the it's so expensive to file the satisfaction, if somebody does not file it and it either goes missing or God forbid there's a fire in the house and it gets lost, it's very difficult to get it another, like a, a substitute, duplicate. a it's duplicate. It's called a duplicate satisfaction. It's always difficult depending, and, and there are a myriad of factors. For example, if it's a smaller lending institution and we're 10 years down the road, they may not exist anymore. Um, if it's a larger institution, such as you know a Chase or a Citibank, they may take uh, a while for them to research their records. You know, if if somebody's in a hurry to close, there's going to be a rate expiring, or, or some other emergency. For example, the house is in, is in foreclosure; they want to close the house on the house. Uh, and time is of the essence, so to speak. Then there is going to be um, you know timing issues, and we need to see those satisfactions of mortgage. And if you don't have them, it's a problem, but it's something that we can work around with adequate proof. And with adequate time. Correct. Which is why I suggest to my clients to bite the bullet and pay the $700 to file the satisfaction so there's one less impediment when they go to sell. Well, that's great, except you're making one assumption. Sometimes the banks don't always issue the SATs. What I mean by is they're required to issue the SATs, but once in a while, once in a blue moon, we ah, will get to it or gets put at the bottom of the pile. And that's why it's important for the title company to to stay on top of them, okay, to stay on top of the satisfactions um, and to get them and to receive them and to record them because, again, it's just about keeping the workflow smooth. Okay. And we also spoke before the broadcast about adverse possession and uh, the importance of certificates. Maybe you can address both of those issues. Well, adverse possession, um, the old rule was adverse possession is you could take claim title to a piece of property that you, uh, let us assume that there is a fence and the fence location was misplaced and the fence should be two feet east, but it's two feet west and the fence encroached on your property. Basically cutting off your access to your own property. When I say fence, I'm talking about a fence with no gate, nobody's walking around it. So you haven't had access to that piece of property for over 10 years. That could be a very, very big uh, problem, especially in certain areas, such as you know properties out east, um, and in properties you know in high, how do I say this? In uh, prestigious neighborhoods where the value of land is greater, that could be very, very uh, problematic for a title insurance company. But it's also problematic for somebody who's selling or buying with the type of insurance that they seek. And that's why every purchaser needs to buy a survey, correct? Correct, absolutely. To, to make sure that all of the land that he or she is buying actually is going to belong to him or mm-hmm. her after after the purchase. Correct. And what about the importance of certificates, whether certificates of occupancy or completion? I see clients who put on extra bathrooms or extended the house and they never got a permit or a certificate and that delays whatever they want to do, whether sell or, or mortgage. What is your advice there? Okay. Um, always. Okay. My advice is first off, whenever you do work, always, uh, consult with the local municipality and re- obtain the proper certificates. And even before you do the work, go down there and make an inquiry. I'm going to tell you a little story about my brother-in-law's house. I represented him. He was up in Mayapak. He had a three bedroom. Years ago, he had a, he expanded it. He made changes to the house, and it became a four-bedroom. 
They called it a four-bedroom, even though there was no separate bathroom. There was no bed in it. It was just a big room contained in the house. Just a, It was basically a playroom. But the town called it a fourth bedroom. And because it had a fourth bedroom, they wanted him to remove his septic tank and change the enlarge the septic tank, which was going to be about a $50,000 job. So ultimately, what satisfied the town was we actually, and this is... This was fascinating. We cut a hole in the wall, and they called it a breezeway. But because there was a hole in the wall, it was no longer considered a bedroom. So we didn't have to change the septic tank. But it still went down as a three-bedroom house, not as a four-bedroom because that's what he had a CFO. When he went to reapply, that's when the problem started. And then you were already in contract. The more the, the buyer was well away under the mortgage uh, with his mortgage application incurred costs like a survey. And he was able to, uh, thankfully, uh, you know, everything worked out in that instance, but it may not always end up that same way. Right. It makes sense to get your permits in order and your certificates in order before you go to sell property, certainly. And I wanted to ask you about something I uh, was working on today, a file getting ready for closing, and the mm -hmm. issue of restoration of taxes. Okay. So we have a lot of exemptions here on Long Island, whether for volunteer firefighters, for senior citizens who meet certain financial uh, barriers, and they pay f less tax. Veterans, and too. Veterans, too, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. there, are, there are a number of categories, and then they go to sell, and the purchasers may not have those categories, and yet, how do they know what their taxes will be and when the county will restore the taxes to the original full amount? Well, one thing that a, a title report Okay, I'm just going to get a little technical now, so please bear with me. When you order title, the first thing you do is uh, obtain a title report. And the report will set forth various uh, items. It'll tell you about back liens, back mortgages, if the seller has any judgments on them, if the buyer has judgments on them, because the bank wants to see if the buyer has any judgments on them. Another thing they will uh, receive is what we call departmentals or munis municipals. And it will be the certificates of occupancy, the certificates of completion, and there'll also be what we call a tax search. And that is very important for the attorneys to look at the tax search because if there is an exemption, you want to make sure that that exemption, okay, at the time of sale, it will probably be removed, most likely be removed, and you want to be able to advise the client as to the hit they're going to ultimately take. Ultimately, okay. when, the, when the county picks up well, on the change of owners. When the county picks up on the change of owners, or again, if you have a bank where they are uh, escrowing your taxes, the banks may soon hit the uh, mortgagor up for a big increase because the town finally got around to removing the restored factor on the taxes, and you're paying, you know, now, now you have no exemptions, you're paying the full ride, so to speak, on taxes, and the bank will escrow for those. And now we're going to move to a segment I call, What is on Your Desk? A recent matter which you can use to illustrate a teachable legal moment to the listeners. And I think what we're going to talk about is the anti-flip taxes. Um, right now, a New York uh, making its way through the Assembly and the Senate is a bill which will basically make it not illegal, but it will. Uh, there'll be a tax um, on one to five family residential properties, where the property is sold. If it's less than one year, it's a twenty percent tax, and if it's less than two years, it's a fifteen percent tax. What they want to do is basically they are looking to, and of course there are several exemptions. So if you're listening to this, don't go crazy just yet. For example, if you're a builder and you built a new house obviously that uh, tax will not apply to you. If you are uh, selling a, uh, a house to a family member, as long as it's a family member as, as, as defined in the statute, there's no tax. If you're in foreclosure, okay, or you've had a job relocation and you can prove it, then uh, if, uh, if any type of financial hardship, then you are exempt from paying the tax. What the tax really does zero in on are people who are speculators. So if I go to a foreclosure, and I bid, and I, again, with my background, this happened quite a lot. I bid on a piece of property. I, uh, I'm the successful bidder. I acquire title. I either myself or I hire a contractor to come in, make renovations, improve the property, and I turn around and I sell that to a an arm's length third party purchaser. You know, nobody who's related to me. 
I will be banged for that tax. And that's bad, and I'll tell you why. One of the, one of the primary objectives of having a foreclosure sale is to drive up prices. You always want to get maximum dollar on a foreclosure sale because... You're talking about the lender getting the maximum no, dollar. No, I'm talking about at the foreclosure sale. Because if I'm the homeowner and I'm being foreclosed, you know, in a perfect world, I will not, will the, not only will the bank get paid off, but I may receive some money. That would be the difference between the mortgage, the amount that I, the debt Correct. that I owe the bank and what is actually received. Correct. And you're saying, and I don't do foreclosure work, mm -hmm. you're saying that the owner of the house gets that difference. Correct. So let us assume I'm, uh, the house goes to a, at, at auction and is sold for $500,000 and the bank is owed $400,000 that homeowner has $100,000 worth of his equity to walk uh, away with. How, how often does that happen, though? I understood does, foreclosures uh, usually sell for less than the value. That is correct. That is correct because back in 2008 when we had the recession, the downfall, a lot of houses were uh, shot down in value, and there were tons and tons of, of houses and REOs, which is real estate owned. Those are the properties that go back to the bank that the bank ultimately lists with brokers and sells. That's also an exemption. Uh, REOs are exempt. Uh, under the new statute. But again, the whole pur purpose is nowadays you're having fewer. Um, I saw a week or two ago, the number of foreclosures in New York State is it's, I want at its lowest level. Prices have stabilized and interest rates are very low. Although somebody pointed out that foreclosures were up in Manhattan. I think somebody said it was almost 100%. But then we were talking about like literally like 22 foreclosures to like 40 foreclosures in Manhattan. So Still that's a yeah. very small amount. Yeah, correct, overall. Okay, and what do you see, Paul, in terms of legislative changes, meaning what's happening in Albany? I've heard about a bill which is suggesting the establishment of a public title insurance company. Yep. What do you hear about that? Well, um, this is not the first time it's happened. Um, just for everybody out there, there is one state in the country that has a state-run title insurance, and that state is Iowa. The other 49 states have companies such as WFG and other companies that provide the title insurance. Um, back in, in the mid-2000s, there was something that we called the Brodsky Bill, which was a um, bill in which the New York State would take over the issuance of title insurance. And that bill ultimately was never really voted on or defeated or went away on its own because New York State, I think once they started doing a little bit of homework, realized the scope of what what it takes to insure title, the voluminous records that have to be researched, the amount of work, just the general amount of work that need, that goes into reading a title and clearing a title and getting to the title, uh, and getting to the table, and then following up. But now, again, uh, it's like everything else, it always comes back, and uh, now there is a, an assembly person who introduced a public option. He's not going to, he is to be, he's not saying that New York State is going to take over all the, the entire industry, he just wants to introduce a, quote, public option. And there is a bill right now to study the public option. And it's interesting because it mentions a, uh, the composition of a board, but on this board, no one from the title insurance industry is allowed to be on this board. From the private title insurance industry. Correct. I understand what you're saying. What is it? What would be the difference between a public title insurance company and a private? Meaning, are there pros or cons to the consumer, to the homeowner? Absolutely. The quality of service. As I said, you know, there's one thing I, and I said it out uh, and you had posed the question before, is there a difference in pricing between various underwriters? And the answer is no. We are all, we are all a filed rate state. So the only thing I can compete on is service. So wait, a filed rate state means that up in Albany, they regulate what you can charge. Correct. It's, it's, it, so whether I go to you or I go to a different underwriter, it's the same price. Correct. It's the same price in New York. Absolutely. And so what is going to differentiate us from everybody else? Service. And I'll be honest with you, that's one thing, you know, uh, I've stayed, you know, on the, on certain transactions, seven, eight o'clock at night, sometimes in the office going through deals. Uh, I do not know if you're going to have that type of level of service with a public option. I'd like to see it. But. That's because these, uh, employees of a proposed title insurance company that is public would be public employees as opposed to private employees with an, a financial incentive. Correct. Is that the reason? Yep. So it's like going to the DMV or to any other New York State 
uh, agency, those are the types of employees. And they're wonderful. They're great. But generally, they stop working at four or five, right? Um, yeah, well, you know, the bottom line is very simply that it's, it would be very, very difficult to train a general employee to learn title insurance. It's something that you're almost takes years to learn. Also, also, you need attorneys there. You need attorneys who can actually understand the laws, who can understand how they're applied, and what the legal issues are for the client. So I'm Correct. just wondering how they would find attorneys for that. Uh, I do not know. They would have to hire them. And then, of course, you know, it's like everything else. I hate to bring this example up, but we had off-track betting, which when New York State and New York City took that over, it turned out to be a debacle. So... Um, you know, I th I th you know, if there's going to be a public option, I wish them the best. Okay. And that's it for our 26th episode. Thank you, Paul, for well, coming on the podcast well, thank today. Thank you for having me. I look forward to being asked, invited again. You will definitely be. And to our listeners, be sure to download this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And while you are there, please rate us with a review that might start. I just heard on the LI Law podcast that the Suffolk County Water Authority is finally getting serious about treating and eliminating water contaminants, including 1,4-dioxane. Starting January 1st, 2020, the Water Board will add an additional quarterly charge on bills for 395,000 residential and commercial customers in Suffolk County. On November 21st, 2019, the Water Board unanimously approved a fee in the sum of $177 million over the next five and a half years to clean the water. And that will mean that customers in Suffolk County will pay an additional $80 per year or $20 per quarter to implement the treatment of toxins in the Suffolk County water system. New York City water is still some of the best water available and has been found to have fewer contaminants than the water on both Nassau and Suffolk County systems. Nassau County water authorities have not yet taken any steps to address this pervasive problem. The LA Law Podcast lets you know what's going on on Long Island and is your podcast for local tips which educate and entertain. Thanks for listening.